Uh, hey everyone, uh, my name is Akshay Bahadur. Today I'm going to be presenting a topic on resource utilization as a metric for machine learning. Uh, and in this presentation, we'll be talking about how exactly the resource utilization part, which is often overlooked for machine learning, is very important, especially uh, in a developing country like India, uh, where we don't have a lot of resources. So uh, this using this technique, we are going to make sure that we uh, use the model sufficiently and get the most out of uh, every model. So let's get started. Uh, firstly, I would just like to acknowledge uh, ISODS for uh, organizing this event and also making it available uh, for everybody uh, in the world. So I'm currently speaking from India and I'm pretty sure that my message will be sent across very nicely. So just wanted to thank them for organizing such an event at such a large scale. So just wanted to discuss a bit about myself. Uh, as already mentioned, my name is Akshay. Now, I'm a software developer and engineer for Symantec. I work in the data platform engineering team for Symantec and you work with big data analytics and it's pretty interesting. Uh, also just a shout out to my managers uh, at Symantec for helping me uh, in my own personal research and also uh, believing in uh, what I'm uh, you know, trying to achieve. Also, uh, I'm also an Intel software innovator, uh, which means that I have access to uh, Intel resources, uh, which makes it super easy uh, to do a lot of experimentations. And also, I'm a developer expert for machine learning from Google, uh, which also means that I have uh, support uh, in terms of resources, and guidance uh, working with uh, TensorFlow and other technologies. And on the right hand corner, you can see this is my website. So uh, I'll be sharing the links to all the documents and all the slides. So you can, if you want, you can definitely check out my profile uh, uh, and my uh, website where I upload all the work that I'm currently doing or, other, or I have already done. So this is the agenda. Uh, We'll go with some of the basic steps like normalization, optimization, certain activation, why, why is it important? And uh, then how is network architecture important? Then we'll discuss a very interesting research paper and how using these techniques that I have discussed above, I was able to get a very good accuracy uh, on a state of the art uh, model. And at the end of it, uh, I'll be discussing about one of the projects that I'm currently working on and how I'm helping, uh, how I'm getting help from Google um, into uh, completing this. Uh, so let's get started. So before I start, just wanted to uh, talk to you about my motivation. And when I started working in the field, I did it just because I knew that it sounded pretty cool. Uh, but somewhere on the line, I saw this video, one of my friends actually showed me this video and change my whole perception of what I thought. So I'm just going to play this video. Uh, it's, it's about a girl or a, a lady uh, named Tanya and how her perseverance helped Google uh, into integrating Morse code in the Google keyboard. Okay, so let's, let's uh, get started. Thank you. 
Okay, so this was a story uh, which actually inspired me, and I hope that inspires you as well. Uh, so let's uh, now move on to the next slide. Uh, okay, so this is one of the first uh, slides, and we will be talking about a very uh, simple data set. It's called a Gemini IC, uh, which is for detecting handwritten digits. So first of all, uh, so this slide uh, is going to be a mix of a bit of code uh, and some sort of uh, images, which is going to be the output for that. And then we'll discuss that uh, when we go ahead. Okay, so I'm, I'm pretty sure that you might you might have actually solved MNIST, uh, but I'm going to give it a bit of a twist and then let's see if you are able to figure out uh, what exactly I'm trying to do. Okay, so first of all, I would just want to see how many does it looks like. And this is probably one of the most easiest steps because I just, uh, for every problem, uh, you know, we probably would want to see how our data set looks like. I'm just printing out the images. So uh, when we uh, do a show data, I know that uh, this is the image of the digit three and the label three. So we have a, a very, uh, you know, basic idea of uh, the image size is 20 by 28 and it's black and white. So uh, let's go ahead. Uh, so if we do, uh, if we print up the shape uh, that we just saw, it's 28 by 28, which means that it does not have any color. It's black and white, and it's 28 pixels in height and width. Now let's look at the pixel intensity. So when I look at the pixel intensity, I see that the values uh, lie between zero and 255. So uh, which means uh, zero is the lowest uh, number for a pixel intensity and 255 being the highest. Correct. One thing that we notice is this matrix very sparse. So there's a lot of difference between the maximum and the minimum value, uh, right? Uh, but that's pretty normal because this is how a uh, color image should be. Uh, but let's let's see what exactly can we do. So one of the very simple concepts is that of, of mathematics, which you might have studied back in 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 college uh, and that process is called as normalization in which we use a simple statistical concept that we want to make sure that the range of, of our data set uh, is is between a certain value right so let's say if i want to have the data set range between zero and one i will divide it by the maximum value and that's what i'm trying to do here i'm, I'm providing the whole data set by 255 which is the maximum intensity of a pixel and straight away, straight away we see that the minimum value or the least value remains over zero, but the maximum value is now one. So instead of the value being values being very far away from each other, the values are now clustered very close, and they are the values between zero and one. And the mean is zero point five. Now, uh, from statistics, we also understand that if the mean is zero, then we have higher chances chances of convergence. Therefore, I have used another form of normalization in which the mean is zero. Therefore, I'm dividing it by, I'm dividing the entire data set by half of the maximum value and then subtracting one from it. Right? And we are going to make sure that our shape remains the same, which is true. And if you see here, the least value is minus one and the maximum value is plus one. So we are pretty sure that we have set the range of our value, but at the same time, we have maintained a mean, which is zero. And this might help in convergence uh, theoretically, but let's see. Okay. Uh, so I'm just trying to print out a couple of examples. Uh, this is a training set is 60,000, and I have 10,000 in my test set. And we, this is the shape, 28 by 28, which means it's black and white image. And the white frame means that the values lie between zero to nine. Therefore, we have 10 classes. Now, uh, the important thing here is if you have worked with image data before, you might uh, be under the impression that we are supposed to use CNNs. And that's absolutely true. Uh, CNNs work very well with image data. But let's say I would, I only have a low resources. CNN require a lot of resources. So if we use a very simple uh, SC layer and try to still uh, get maximum accuracy. Let's see how that could be done. 
okay so if we use just this simple algorithm uh, or this simple model which has a flattened layer uh, which flattens the uh, the length to well, length and length and depth into a single line and then we have used there some dense layers and then we have used simple atom optimizer and a categorical cross entropy loss uh, and let's see how exactly are we going to uh, get our accuracy in this right so this is my model i'm going to play the summary to see exactly what's happening and then everything is the same we can only train for two epochs because we have we are running on low resources and we are then plotting accuracy and loss uh, so if you plot the more direct uh, if you plot the summary of the model we see that there are dense layers and then at the end of it we have a final layer uh, of then six which is uh, categorizing our Im image into one of ten digits and we'll also look at the trainable parameters right let's see what happens uh, so if we train it for two epochs we see that the accuracy is around 20 percent in the first epoch and 26 percent in the second epoch uh, which is pretty okay uh, for a normal model and to be uh, just to recall we are not using normalized data so the data lies between 0 and 255 and we are getting uh, accuracy of 26 percent and we are taking 62 microseconds per step pretty uh, okay now we only do one change instead of using unnormalized data we'll use a normalized data which has a mean of 0.5 let's see how this fits so everything else is the same the number of epochs is to match that is 64 everything else is the same the only thing that i've changed is instead of x um, the data the normal data that we have is we are using a normalized version of the data in which the, the, the pixel values lie between 0 and 1 and the mean being 0.5 now immediately we see that instead of getting a 20 percent accuracy they are hovering around 93 percent so with only a simple mathematical approach we have increased our accuracy by four times uh, which means that we have to train for lesser epochs to get higher accuracy and hence we are saving on resources okay and just to be very clear we are training it right from scratch therefore the validation accuracy has improved from minus infinity uh, to 95% and then finally to 96%, right? And now, if we used uh, a, a normalized data with with mean zero, we still get similar accuracy of about 82 to 85%, which is pretty okay. And uh, we are still getting four times the accuracy from the unnormalized data, uh, although it's not higher than the 0 0.5 normalized normalized data, but still. So, just wanted to make you guys understand that we are using a very simple concept of normalization which you guys must have heard of uh, back in statistics in, in your college uh, but just a single line of code which is very easy to understand and very easy to implement can affect your accuracy up to a very high extent okay so this was the first technique and it's pretty uh, interesting because in in this case as we are seeing the accuracy is already is almost going down or maybe it's, it's, it's almost the same which means that we are not learning anything new at the same time if you look at this accuracy it's around 92 percent uh, right which means that we are using low resources we are using a normal network not even a cnn and we are still getting getting good accuracy we are saving a lot of resources now let's look at the optimizer. Uh, so we are going to use the same uh, model that we have just used. The only thing that we have changed is now we have added an optimization. Okay? So if you look at uh, our model, instead of the atom optimizer, we are going to use different optimizer and then we're going to see how is that going to affect our accuracy or our performance. Right? So if you look at uh, this model, uh, everything is the same. They have the same number of parameters, they have the same shape. The only thing that has changed is that we are using different optimize, optimizers. Let's see how that affects our, our whole problem. Right, so SGD, Stochastic Gradient Descent. Uh, this optimizer is used because it's uh, the, the main part of the main, the crux of uh, SGD is that it performs learning after each uh, data point, right? 
And what exactly this means is that, let's say that using SGD as an optimizer, and we are sending our normalized data with only one epoch, uh, we are going to get not a very good accuracy. So we are, we are getting 54% accuracy. However, it's just using 59 microseconds. So <clears throat> if you use an op, uh, RMS prop, uh, which we're using right now, we are using 65, 64 microseconds, and we are getting higher accuracy. But let's say if we have a, if we have a, a use case in which you want to make uh, predictions quickly, uh, or maybe the data is a streaming data, and I want to learn very quickly on that, stochastic gradient descent is very useful in, in that particular use case. And let's move on. So Adam optimizer is pretty popular. Um, and if you look at, at, at this one, uh, using, using the same thing, it takes a bit more time, like 72 microseconds per step, uh, but the accuracy is similarly, uh, it's around 85%, which is pretty good for uh, for you know for a starting point. Now, other delta is also something similar uh, to a leather optimizer. It also takes a lot of time, and the accuracy is almost the same. Uh, so I just wanted to reiterate that this is just a uh, this is not a benchmark uh, because we are using MNISC data set. Uh, for benchmarking, we have to use um, the same technique on a lot of different data sets. But this is just uh, from what we have already studied that uh, SGD is pretty fast. We've already seen that it's pretty fast uh, in terms of uh, you know saving on the microseconds. However, Adam is more accurate. So you have to pick your optimizer called according to the use case. Now let's discuss about different activations. So we are going to use the same model once again. And instead of activating the lens layers uh, from the loop, we are going to use different activations. And let's see how that affects the model. And if you see again, the shape is the same, the number of parameters is the same. Uh, but let's, let's just see what happens. Right, sigmoid, uh, very uh, interesting. Uh, the important thing for activations is that we want to make sure that our model not only learns linear uh, relationships but no, non-linear ones as well. So sigmoid is very pretty simple. Uh, the values lie between zero and one. Um, if you look at the uh, if you sigmoid and atom, uh, which is like a pretty basic uh, fundamental activation function, they're getting an access of about 79% and it's pretty fast. So it's 61 microseconds per step. Right, and if you use ELU, which is pretty popular, uh, although it's taking up slightly more time, the accuracy is higher. So ELU is definitely uh, preferred. And then we have other active, uh, other kind of um, you know uh, variations of ELU, which is leaky uh, ELU, uh, uh, which is uh, a threshold ELU as well, which performs uh, well in some cases. But then of course, all these things are more of uh, dependent on your use case. So if you feel that uh, you want to try a different optimizer, definitely go for it. And uh, yeah, so mostly ReLU is the go-to activation these days. And one more activation that is recently come out and is pretty interesting is Mish. Um, and I will definitely give the link to for that uh, activation as well. You can have a look at that. And maybe try that out and let let us know if that works really good for you. One of the important techniques that has been used is learning rate decay, um, in which you want to make sure that uh, as as we go down uh, or as we go towards the minima, as we converge towards the minima, we want to make sure that we don't overshoot from the minima. So in that case. It's, it's okay if we have a very high learning rate in the start because we are trying to go towards the minima, but as soon as we reach close to the minima, we want to learn slowly and get towards the exact point of the minima. Therefore, learning rate decay is pretty interesting. And let's see how it is done. So in, in Keras, what we have done is we have used a callback, and on each callback, uh, what I've done is that I'm getting the learning rate, and then I'm dividing it uh, by the number of iterations. So this is what happens and I'm also, also printing it so that it becomes clear that after these many epochs my act, my uh, learning rate is, is uh, decreasing and then if you see this is the important part here callbacks is Adam learning rate 
face or, or character and then and then i'm doing on every batch end so my batch is of 64 after every 64 uh after every batch of 64 data points uh, i'm going to uh, go ahead and decrease my learning rate let's see how that happens so as you see after the first uh, in the first epoch after the first batch uh the learning rate is 0 0.0001 and then it keeps on decreasing and the story goes on and at the end of the uh, at the end of uh, 900 uh, 900 iterations i have around 0 0.0001 uh, and the accuracy is around 85 to 86 percent with validation accuracy of 94 percent and this is uh, an important technique uh, that is used to make sure that we don't overshoot the minimum. Now let's look at a, a, a very simple example uh, which I have developed. Um, so this is actually uh, EMNIST, which is alphabetic uh, alphabetical um, uh, recognition, alphabet recognition. But I've added a bit of a twist to it. I have used a simple image processing technique uh, to actually be able to draw uh, on the on the webcam. So let's see, let's see how it works. So in this video, if you if you see, uh, I have used three uh, models. So we have a simple LR model or regression. We have a shallow network and we have a deep network. And if you notice, in most of the cases, the deep network is going to outperform the other networks because the deep network is able to maintain a better a kind of as you can see understanding of the letters that i'm trying to draw so uh mostly if, if you look at if you look at the entire application let's see h is only being recognized by a deep network uh, right so this makes sense uh and also at the same time i also wanted to just showcase the fact that if you integrate your machine learning application with uh you know uh, these uh, other uh, techniques like computer vision or even IoT, it makes it more accessible. Uh, and I was able to do that. I studied uh, a computer vision as a part of my uh, bachelor's degree and more out of my own interest. And I was able to connect the dots once I got the time. So uh, you guys can have a look at this code as well. I'll provide the link. And it's going to definitely be very interesting if you guys work on something similar and integrate it with different technologies right so let's move ahead uh, the next one is also an application that i developed it's called as the encoder uh, and if you look closely um, what i'm going to do in this video is i have a digit i'm drawing a digit and then i'm asking my uh, the machine to draw the same digit from its own memory and we're using a simple network we're using a deep network, and here we are using a CNN network. And CNN works very well with images. So if you see, CNN network has a better accuracy. So if you see clearly, CNN is able to draw a better image uh, from its own memory, right? So this makes sense. And this is also present in my GitHub. So if you want to have a look at that, it's pretty interesting as well. Right, so let's move on. Uh, so the second thing that we want to discuss is network architecture optimization and how crucial is the network architecture. And in order to do that, we'll be using the CIFAR 10 uh, data set. Let's look at the data set. It has 50,000 examples right here and we are using test examples as 10,000. Now, important thing, important thing to notice here is that it has three channels. So this means that this is a color image of 32 by 32 height and width. <clears throat> and also at the same time, it only has uh, 10 labels. So each uh, image is one from the 10 labels that are specified. So once again, what you want to do is you want to see how the data looks like. And if you look at the image, it's 32 by 32 and it's a color image, and it's difficult to um, guess from normal eye. I think it's a toad, 
and the label is given as six. So yeah, so this kind of um, kind of makes us understand that if us as humans are having difficulty uh, understanding it, uh, machine is going to suffer a lot when it's trying to uh, predict which image belongs to which class. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to use a fully connected architecture, which means that we will not use a CNN. So we are using something similar that we had used in our previous uh, in the previous examples as well. So we have flattened the uh, the image uh, into 32 by 32 by 3, and then using, we are using a dense uh, network, uh, sorry, dense layer, then another dense layer, then a bit of dropout because you want to don't want to off it. And then again a dense, and then finally after dropout we have a dense uh, for our output layer into the number of classes. We're using a simple categorical class, cross and copy loss because we know that we have ten classes, optimize the atom, and we are monitoring accuracy. Let's look at how we frame that. So number of box of five, batch size is sixty-four. Let's see how it looks like. The number of trainable parameters are around 3 million, or even 4 million, and this is how it looks like. And if you look at how it has trained, the accuracy is almost the same, or even going down. So we are not learning anything at all, right? So if you look at the accuracy, it actually goes down, then comes back up, then it goes down, which means that we are not learning anything. So a, a normal fully connected architecture is not very helpful if you're working with very complex images which does not have a lot of information anyway. So now we we'll use a CNN network, a CNN architecture. Um, so CNNs are basically very popular, not exactly very popular, but very useful. They are popular of course, but they are also very useful when it comes to image data. To know why, uh, you're going to have to read a lot. Uh, about CNNs, but just to give you an understanding, if you look at the CNN layer, what we're going to say is that we are going to use 32 different filters, and each of these filters are going to remember one aspect of the image. Okay, and by remembering one aspect, I mean that either one filter can only look at uh, 90 degree uh, lines in the image, one filter could only look at, let's say, circular part of the images. So once these filters uh, combine together and then they try to see how exactly an image is activated uh, based on which of these filters are getting activated. So it becomes very easy um, for a CNN to be able to identify even with two images if they are very close to each other, they, are, they will still be able to get it pretty accurately. So let's see, the only thing that we have changed is that we have introduced CNN layers and then we are patterning that out. And then of course, at the end of the day, there is a dense layer again. Let's see how it looks like, right? So if you see that we only are using 300,000 uh, parameters, trainable parameters instead of 3 million, which means that it's pretty quick. And at the same time, if you see that the accuracy is actually going up, so from 22% goes up to 36%, and if we plot it, we can see that we are learning something, although it's pretty slow. If you if we add a, a bit more uh, CN layers, or if the image is uh, is of higher resolution, we are going to definitely learn a lot of other information. Now, I wanted to discuss about this research paper. So this research paper is one of the uh, modules for self-driving car which is called as behavioral cloning, in which given the image of the road, we want to identify the shading angle, right? And this was actually a paper this written by NVIDIA, in which they uh, collected around two GB worth of data of different of different uh, shading angles and the, uh, the image of the road. And they did a research paper, they, they published a, a model based on the paper. Now, uh, I'll discuss the problem that was that were present in the paper and how I, I have tried to overcome it, but let's first look at the, the data, right? So it's around three GB of zip data. If you open it up, it's around seven to eight GBs. 
and this is how the image looks like uh, this is the image of the road and there will be a steering angle which i have printed but yeah and then this is the second image so now we can see that uh, there are different landscapes here the there's a there's a car in between here there is no car in between but yeah let's see uh, and then of course it's a three uh, three dimensional image so we are i mean we have three channels so it's a color a colored image and this is the model that was being used in the research paper and if you look at it it's a lot of convolutions that are going on right and then finally if you look at the most important aspect is that it's using 132 132,000 trainable parameters, right? Which means that it has, it is going to use a lot of resources. Let's see if we could better that, right? And then of course, total pixels per image is around 40K. Now, uh, if we try to resize the image into 200 by 200, which is being used by, by the research paper, uh, this is how the RAM usage looks like. So if we load all the images in the RAM, it's going to be used around 8.7 GB of my RAM, which is very difficult because I don't load if I don't have this much amount of RAM. So now we'll discuss about how can we handle this out of memory issue. All right, one of the things is color scaling, in which I'll just scale the image to 50 by 50. So if you look at this uh, this function the what it does is that it treats each image and then it pre-processes the image in which i'm resizing it or scaling it and if you look at the ram usage i'm using around 1.1 gb of ram right so from using 8.9 gb we have come down to 1.1 gb uh, but the problem is that we might have lost some information uh, but for that uh, we have to go to the next slide and we'll discuss about that problem as well now, if we use a 60 by 50 by 3 image, uh, right, and then I'm using some sort of similar model that was already being used, I'm still using 130K trainable parameters. However, my pixel size is now 10, 7500. Uh, now, if we train it, uh, I can see that the loss is going down. So the loss starts from 21, 0.21, and then it goes on to 0.14, which means that we are learning something. And if we go further down, uh, we are definitely going to learn a lot uh, uh, from this set of images, right? So even though we have we have trimmed the images, we have scaled the images, we are still learning from it, which means that we are still being able to retain most of the information, right? But we can do much better than this. Other thing is called as is what you could apply is is filtering. So what I'm trying to do here is I'm scaled it again to 50 by 50. But at the same time, I've converted the image from color to HSP. Let's look at how it works. So if you look at this image, you can see that there's a clear distinction between the road and the sky because what HSP does is that it plots the, uh, what can you say, the gradient or the darkness level of, of certain portion. So if you see that in this area, the road is especially dark. So I'm hoping that my model learns from this and then ignores the rest of the image. And let's see how it looks like. So I'm going to use the same functionality that we have just used. We have used the pre-processing function, which processes to uh, store the images at HSP. And now instead of using 1.1 GB of RAM, we are just using 760 MB of RAM. So if we have very low resources, or if you're doing it on edge computing, we can still use 750 MB of RAM and still and still be able to train the model on an edge device, which is very difficult to do. Now let's see. Uh, so now using this technique, we have decreased our trainable parameters from 130k to just 30k, right? And let's see because what you want to do is we don't want to lose out information from our image. Let's see if we are able to train it or not, or not. And of course, total pixels per image is 2500 because it's just a black and white image now. So if you train it, we see that the loss is going down. So it starts from around 20, uh, 0.20 or 0.21 and then it goes on to 0.16. 
which is a very good sign because we know that are learning and even though we have lost a lot of information or a lot of data uh, we have used the most of what we had right so all the filtering that we did did not lose much information but we lost a lot of noise from the email uh, and the third technique is using a, a, a technique called a speedy generator function from keras in which what i do is you i have used a generator function which is called a generator from path and it gets only that particular batch from the data set let's look how let's see how it looks like so basically what it does is that whenever you are training or whenever i'm called the training function i can just give the generator from path and it's going to load only the batch size from from the ram so this means that even if i use frame 200 by 200 by 3 image and if the number of frame per parameters are 10 million and the total pixels per image is 120k i'm still being able to learn a lot so it's going to the if you see the loss is exponentially going down and if you see the loss here it's going to be it's going to go down to 0.0074 however the ram uses 12.8 gb to train the entire operation so this is one technique that you could use if you have good resources uh definitely would like to explore more but yeah definitely filtering is thing is one thing that i found very useful because it helps it helps me eliminate a lot of noise from the data and if you want to have a look at how exactly a model performs uh, i have used a, a, a normal video from uh, youtube and if you see uh, the problem is that it, it if it gets a lot of noise so if you see that predictions are coming it's going to left hand side which is not very good uh, but at the same time, it has like a general sense of where to turn exactly. So, and, and of course, if you see this in long roads where you don't have a lot of pedestrians or a lot of noise in between, it performs quite well. So if you see that it's a long, long road that's going on and my steering wheel is, is kind of rotating as per the road direction, right? So if you see that it has to steer towards the right, so the next exit, so it's taking uh, its time but yeah so this makes uh, this, this makes it pretty easy for us to uh, just understand one aspect of of, of uh, how self-driving car must work but self-driving car also involves uh, pedestrian tracking uh, you know and then of course traffic signal detection and then uh, robotics is involved path planning so all these things are definitely involved so this is just one aspect of it and I just want to make you understand that you know we can use simple techniques, like very simple techniques, to get what we actually want. And I've filmed this, this on my old laptop, and this is running on my old laptop. And if you see, because we are doing a lot of pre-processing, we are getting an FPS of about 40 FPS, which is near real time, right? So with that in mind, let's let's move ahead. Uh, so we are almost coming towards the end of the presentation. I hope you got a lot of things to learn. Uh, just wanted to discuss one of the things that I'm currently working on. It's called as Deep Sign or, or Indian Sign like Indian Sign Language. Um, so the problem, the, I just want to discuss the problem segment with you guys first. Is that 14 million people in India are suffering from speech and hearing impairment, right? And within 80 kilometers, the sign language in India changes. And this is my own personal uh, dilemma because uh, I wanted to develop an application which could recognize sign language uh, for deaf and mute people so that they can communicate. But but in India, because we have a lot of regional diversity, uh, each region has its own sign language because uh, there is not a central authority that kind of uh, regulates this. Right. So I've come something of my own. I uh, made a prototype. Uh, uh, which uses machine learning and it uses image processing, computer vision to get something started. So I just wanted to show a, a very qu a quick, a quick prototype of this. Okay, so if you see, uh, I am using a lot, of, a lot of filters to just train or to just uh, work on this part of the image, right? So even though you can see that I have a lot of noise in the background, I have a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, 
background images but still because i used a lot of filters i am able to work in near real time because i filtered out the entire background and i've just kept my facial key points and my hand gestures so this makes it pretty easy for uh, for somebody who does not have a lot of resources to still use this application without the internet right so if we if we go ahead and if if i show you uh, if you want to have a look at the entire project it's there in my youtube channel and uh, although i have not open sourced the code yet because i'm still working on it but then if you want to understand the whole journey you can reach out to me and of course on, in the youtube channel you can find other prototypes that i have developed for the same application um, there as well right so of course i would want to address a lot of q and a's from for everybody but of course because this is a uh, a virtual uh, kind of a, a conference uh, a youtube conference uh, if you want to have any questions you can post them on youtube or uh, you can post them on my github i'm going to share the links to everything that is present here um, including the slides and the code lab uh, collab notebook and you can ask your questions to me on github or on youtube and i will try to answer each and every one of your queries or questions and of course if you want to work with me on some of the projects you can visit my website uh, which is present right here you can visit my website and then we can definitely uh, think of something and i would love to collaborate with each and every one of you and of course just wanted to say thank you for uh, this opportunity i had a lot of fun i hope you got to understand at least oh, one new concept and i hope you actually use that to actually help someone um, in need and i think that that is, that is the whole essence of technology right so this is me akshay bhagwat i'm signing off signing off this is the bitly link uh, bit.ly slash isods hyphen 19 i'll share the link with you if you click on this you will be transported to my github page which has the exact same document uh, exact same slides that we just saw it's going to have a uh, uh, the collab link and of course you can find me on my uh, website as well this is akshay bahadur signing off i hope to see you guys soon all right bye take care